Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. John Geller, and I am uh, really excited about being able to do this presentation for you. I wish I could uh, could do it in person, but uh, we'll make the best of it. And I've got quite a quite a bit of information to share with you. I know you have, you have varied backgrounds, and so I'm hoping to cover lots of different issues and, and hopefully spark some interest and passion in exploring some of these further. Uh, I'm a, a veterinarian. I've worked uh, 20 years as an emergency veterinarian and at the Fort Collins Vet Emergency Hospital here in Fort Collins. I recently transitioned uh, out of doing emergency shifts. They're just too tough um, to keep going much past 20 years. And so I've, I've transitioned into what I call street medicine. Um, and you can probably figure out what that is. It's, it is work, working out on the streets, usually with pets, pets of folks that uh, live on the streets. And I started about five years ago, a nonprofit called the Street Dog Coalition. And we have veterinary teams now in about uh, 40 cities. So we're a nationwide group. Uh, we are based in Fort Collins. So we do a lot of work around here. And we basically do street clinics. Um, in different cities across the United States. And we have team leaders and they kind of figure out what's going on in that area. In doing that work, I've really been pulled into the issue of homelessness, you know, in a bigger bigger picture. And if uh, any of you are in Fort Collins right now, you may, uh, may be aware that there's been a lot of upheaval and changes uh, with the homeless community, which is now set up at, a tent city outside the Oslan Center, uh, right off of College Avenue. Interestingly, that was um, that was an idea that was blocked by City of Fort Collins for a long time when, when we were advocating for a, a free campground. But so there's about uh, 80 tents in that campground now, and about 20 of them um, have have dogs that you know live live in those tents or or houses, which is what they are right now. So we're planning to do some do some work out in, in that area coming up pretty soon. So uh, many, maybe some of you have heard of Three Dog Night, an, an old band, but it's still playing. They uh, they named their group after the idea of a really cold night up in Alaska, where uh, if it was really cold, people would would sleep with three dogs instead of one or two and call it a three dog night. And a hard life made harder refers to the fact that folks that are living on the street already have a hard life. And when they're willing to have, have pets also, and, and many of them absolutely need to have them and are inseparable from them, now their life is even harder. And if we're thinking about today, right now we've had a third layer of difficulty with COVID-19 because many of their services are shut down and they're even more limited in what they can do and access to services and care um, has, has really clamped down. So it's pretty tough times out there. I'm gonna share with you a, a typical case um, that we might deal with. Of course, dogs, uh, veterinarians know that dogs named Lucky usually aren't that lucky uh, in, their, in their lives. And this dog's no different, really nice dog. You can see his owner piggybacking him through, and this is in uh, North Las Vegas, where they have a large uh, homeless connect event where uh, thousands of people show up for a one day event, which includes veterinary care among other services. Lucky uh, piggybacks on his, on his owner's back and everyone thinks it's, re it's really cute, but the reason he's, um, I'm going to show you this. The reason he's piggybacking because he can't walk more than a mile, and the owner walks about seven or eight miles a day. He told me, and he's got these angular limb deformities he was born with on his front feet, so he's he is unable to walk very far. Uh, so his owner just carries him all over the place. If we're just talking about from a veterinary medicine point of view, um, indigent is basically pet owners that have no money and can't pay for services. Um, and we're going to take a closer look at how many of them are there and, and what are the options to them right now and what are some of the new options. Here's an overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. I think some of these ideas might be uh, interesting or new to you. We're going to talk about street medicine. We're going to talk about One Health. Uh, and we're going to talk about co-sheltering. 
last fall we were, uh, our group Street Talk Coalition was in Detroit and many of the uh, houses there have been abandoned and his Rolling Stone magazine in 2012, at that point, uh, a lot of the dogs, the street dogs uh, had decided to take over the homes and were, were actually living in these houses, taking them over and animal control wouldn't even go in. Uh, I kind of photoshopped uh, this picture here on, here on the right, but they actually did see a photograph of some uh, pit bulls looking out the upper, upper floor window. in early 2017 and i'm really i'm just setting the stage for you showing some some different situations i was out at santa Ana riverbed which is a large encampment along a bike trail just like we have around here and there was several miles of tents on each side uh, so hundreds of people living there but there was no facilities no running water nearby no trash no porta potties and it became a huge public health hazard and have had to be shut down. But about half of these folks had, had dogs. And our plan was uh, to take a bicycle with a trailer and, and just slowly go down this trail, tent to tent, uh, providing veterinary care. Literally the week after I was there, this, this got shut down. In the back, you'll see, um, see that statue, which is a metal sculpture, which is part of the California Angels uh, baseball stadium. And so a stark contrast of, of uh, kind of the rich and poor here in Orange County, California, well, one of the richest uh, counties in the United States. There you can see the stadium in the background. You can see some of the tents or shacks. People live here for, they consider really permanent housing for several years this was here. You can see uh, some of these guard dogs, most of them are chihuahuas. Uh, over here on the right, there's actually four of them and you can see them so uh here's a an overhead view kind of see the layout but they shut these folks down the next week and and put them in motels for about a month they paid for it and then after that they just uh, spilled out onto the street and have formed new encampments in other areas and there is a, a kind of a tone of of, des of hopelessness i guess that you see in this person's expression and what's supposed to happen next. I actually have some other pictures that show the same thing. Back in 2018, we went to Indianapolis. Uh, most, they have a river that runs right through the city and down by that river, the White River, they have uh, encampments. Here's the jungle. It ended up getting shut down for the same reason, it became a public health hazard. And the common denominator in these public health hazards is the cities re refuse to provide Public health, sanitation, basic porta potties, water, trash, um, potentially a needle exchange, and and they do turn into a horrible, horrible places and, and end up getting shut down. So the common denominator, common denominator that I'm trying to talk to you about is people that are living outside, not necessarily in shelters, because this is where people with pets have to live. Most shelters, only five percent of shelters in the United States, homeless shelters, allow pets unless they're a service dog. And very, very few of these dogs are, are true service dogs. We're gonna to touch on service dogs later. It's, it's pretty controversial. So we're talking about unsheltered homeless. They're also called um, rough sleepers, uh, kind of an, that's an international term that's been used. It, and of course we have rough sleepers all over the world, lots of different situations. In Western Europe and US, of course, uh, many of these folks do have pets. But in areas like Latin America and Mexico and even the U.S. here on Navajo reservations, some of the street dogs are actually community pets that run around and don't necessarily stay with one person. This was just a United Nations observer that visited San Francisco and Oakland and was pretty, pretty, pretty shocked by what they saw. These numbers are a little outdated, but they actually haven't sheltered. Uh, sorry, they haven't changed much. And looking at uh, the homeless count, it's about 500,000 to 600,000 in the United States. And most people that know anything about it say it's probably about twice that because there's one day every year in January, they try to count all the homeless folks in the United States and they're gonna miss some. You know, they're under bridges, they're in the bushes, they're in the woods. Um, the ones in the shelter do get counted, two thirds of them are in shelter, but one third are, are unsheltered. And those are, again, most of the ones that have pets. 
here's some that are probably uncounted, you know, living on couches. They may be in a house, but it's not their house. So, so they're technically homeless. Uh, many of them do live in vehicles. It's pretty common sharing motel rooms. There's a good chance they're not going to get, get counted. They might be travelers. There's a, a fellow in Boulder with his dogs. This, and this guy had really fallen on hard times. He used to be a corporate pilot. And unfortunately, he got caught. Uh, he was uh, transporting some marijuana interstate and spent a fair amount of time in jail. When severely depressed right now, and his dog is about the only thing that uh, keeps him going. I'll take a few minutes on this slide just because it is an important question where we've got homeless pets living in shelters. Um, they are protected from the elements, they are well taken care of. And then we've got pets of the homeless that don't actually have a house to live in, but are living with their uh, guardian. Um, their human mate and um, probably have better lives would be what I would say. Doing some number crunching, most estimates are about five to ten percent of homeless individuals have pets in the United States. That number, uh, so back calculating from the five hundred thousand to a million, there's maybe fifty thousand to hundred thousand pets we're talking about that are living. Uh, with their homeless pet owners, most of them are living outside on the street. Big variations in how many uh, people have pets that are homeless. For example, in Southern California, uh, San Diego especially, 20, 30, 40 percent uh, have pets. But in areas like big cities like Detroit and Washington, D.C., where it's just tough to get on transportation, very few of them have pets. Here is a case I saw in, in Fort Collins that shows you just some of the challenges faced from a veterinary point of view. This is a view inside this gentleman's van. He lives in his van with two cats and a chicken. And he was using the chicken uh, to lay eggs, actually. And you know, he had a hot plate um, in, in a way to cook those up. So, but unfortunately, when I saw him, his chicken was not doing well, was kind of shut down, not laying eggs, very lethargic, had an upper respiratory infection you can see with it the nares eyes are closed the nares are, are kind of blocked the nasal passages uh, some nasal discharge his cats had this area of um, this one cat at least of patchy skin we do a skin scraping to see what's going on there just with a blade and, and then look in a microscope we see these this is a mite most mites uh, don't necessarily change change species but they do move around um, they definitely can move around between animals and sometimes they can cross over to people. The tough part about this case is the owner himself, he showed me his arms and this is kind of what they look like. They're covered these uh, uh, red placules and um, it looks like he had, it looks like these mites or possibly the, the lice, the black um, poultry lice that were around this you know, chicken's dish may have ended up on on his skin and showing this, um, ending up with this condition. So basically told him to you know, get some new bedding, try to wash his bedding. He said he couldn't afford it. Uh, I think we gave him you know, a little bit of money to go up to Walmart and, and try to get some new bedding. And, and then like so many cases that we see, um, he disappeared. You know, I was supposed to see him next week, he was gone. So definitely those things to follow up. There are a lot of public health issues if some of you have are coming from a public health point of view, but if you think about pets that are living outside, most pets are outside at the most say 12 hours a day. And that's really where their the risk of disease is. It's usually not much uh, happens inside as far as infectious disease, but you can see if they spend 24 hours a day outside, all the this risk is just gonna go proportionally. So they're really facing double the risk of, of uh, things like Rabies, which is very low risk to start with, but definitely out there, uh, certainly getting involved in, in fights with other dogs, possibly um, getting involved with humans, parasites, internal parasites, external parasites, ectoparasites, lice, mice, mites, uh, involved with mosquitoes, which spread heartworm, and other infectious disease are, are much higher risk for this population. There's a really interesting book out there called My Doggy Always Is First by Dr. Leslie Irvin, who's a sociologist at CU Boulder. 
and she interviewed hundreds of homeless pet owners across the United States and discovered that um, not only were these pets really important to their own happiness and quality of life, but for most of these pets actually had a better life than our own pets. And if you think about it, it does make sense. They're living outside, they're living an act, active outdoor lifestyle. They're with their masters 24 seven. They're, they are very well socialized. So for the most part, they're very used to, to being around other people, lots of people, lots of dogs, lots of noises, uh, maybe riding on public transportation. And their owners really care about them and, and, and these pets give their owners purpose. So where there is probably no other purpose. So uh, getting, finding them dog food, making sure they have a dog coat, um, and they're and they're keeping well, staying well is a top priority for for many of their owners. And that's where uh, veterinary medicine comes in, is trying to provide the veterinary care and even uh, pet food sometimes. Here's some folks with a fairly large uh, animal family uh, living outside. They're they're not even sure where they are exactly, but they're obviously in a nice climate where uh, life is probably pretty good for all of them. I mentioned earlier the purposelessness of life for, for many homeless folks. And if you do talk to them, that will become apparent. Basically because they're kind of invisible and, and they're just lying, maybe lying um, on the sidewalk and people step over them and nobody really cares what they do. So uh, take, taking care of their pets only does provide them that purpose in life. Life on the street, you know, we talked about how tough it is already. and Women that are living on the street really face additional dangers in terms of um, violence and sexual crimes. So they're, they're especially vulnerable. And, and dogs play, having pets plays a big role for these women. We're going to talk about that a little, a little bit more. In addition to companionship and obviously protection, they actually can be uh, navigators. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. I showed you some um, pictures from Las Vegas and have definitely spent some time in Las Vegas. This is a Las Vegas, probably none of you have seen North Las Vegas. And it's tough, it's a concrete jungle. People are living on sidewalks and they're living in these tunnels that go under the freeway on north of town. There's actually no light in there. This is just some artificial lighting. There's no electricity, uh, but they've managed to salvage a bunch of items and they'll set up their little apartments in these tunnels and uh, many of them do have pets. Unfortunately, several times a year, there's Las Vegas is usually really dry, but they almost always have these big gully, gully washers, which will run right through these tunnels, wash everybody out, and they have to start all over again. And, and it's usually, uh, it's not uncommon to have several drownings when that happens. So it's, it's pretty tough, but uh, this is where uh, many of them live. Here's life uh, out on the sidewalk. You can just, you can really see the despair in this person's face without any any good place to go. I was going to go back for a second, just show you that, that headline. You're probably wondering what that's about. When I was out there, and that was in 2017, in February, we were doing a street clinic. Uh, we actually had pretty low turnout in the street clinic, and, and we, we saw these police cars buzzing around and city officials, and that's what kept people away. They don't, they don't really want to be, be around authorities, but uh, they set up this thing where there was a, a serial murderer that was killing homeless men that were sleeping on the sidewalk, bludgeoning to death. So they set up a video camera with a mannequin covered with a sleeping bag, and they actually caught, caught this guy in the act of, of bludgeoning this mannequin and, of course, traced him back to previous murders. Here, here's three women uh, that I've worked with, uh, one in Austin, Texas, one in Las Vegas, one in Fort Collins that uh, live on the street with their pets. And in addition to providing protection, I mentioned they act as navigators. And the navigator is kind of in two ways. Sometimes if you just, and they've told me this, they say, maybe they're in a new city. They just don't know where to go. They'll actually let their dog lead the way. And they usually end up in some place uh, where they needed to go. But more than that, um, let me back up, sorry. Navigators has to do with 
evaluating someone's trustworthiness. So just as your own pet probably can pick up the vibe of some person you you meet by how they act and maybe tell give you the message of that person's trustworthy or not. The dogs out on the street can do the same thing where there is such high risk. Interesting study that was done a while ago. Of folks living on the streets showed that 80% of, of the chronically homeless, and these are ones that li literally live on the street most of their adult life, have a history of traumatic brain injury, which really isn't surprising. We know mental health is a huge, huge problem for, for those that are living on the street. And many of those mental health problems derive from uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, which could include things like PTSD and certainly homeless veterans would be um, an example of where we find that pretty commonly. This was a concerning study that came out not too long ago in the Journal of American Medical Association showing that the ones that are living outside, we call them rough sleepers, unsheltered homeless, are three times as more likely to die as homeless that are in shelters and 10 times more likely to die from the general population in Massachusetts. So it's, it's definitely rough out there. We went to New York City last year and did our first street clinic and um, ran in all kinds of people. We did our street clinic in the lower, uh, lower Greenwich Village, so had a pretty good variety of, of folks there. Um, this one picture on the left is actually away from Greenwich Village. I think it's actually closer to Coney Island, uh, showing some folks hanging out with their pets. We were working out on the street outside a church called Graffiti Church. And we had, um, it was kind of a One Health type of clinic. And I'll talk more about what One Health is, but we had Planned Parenthood there, there with their band doing HIV testing. We had dog groomers doing bathing. And oh, we had some other services for folks, free meals. And it was kind of a, a real happy chaos, I would say, kind of see from see what's going on out on the street. I had this veteran veteran um, tell me this, uh, that if it wasn't for his dog, he would probably have committed suicide. And he, he told me that by making um, slashing motions across his wrist with his other hand. And uh, he, he's a homeless veteran at one of our veteran stand down events. And that's actually at the Aslan Center in Fort Collins. And for these homeless veterans, it seems like uh, their pets are really, really important to not just keep them, keep them happier, but to keep them from, uh, keep them alive from committing suicide. So there's definitely a lot of work being done providing pets to veterans, not just homeless veterans, those with PTSD, to help try to prevent this uh, suicide rate, which is up to about 21 uh, veterans a day commit st still commit suicide. That hasn't really budged. There's still close to 30,000 homeless veterans in this country. Uh, here's a few, a few of the ones that we have worked with. Uh, one on the left is a Vietnam veteran uh, in Lafayette, Colorado. One on the right is um, probably an Iraqi, Iraq war veteran in North Carolina. Chris is a, an Army veteran from Fort Collins. Here's a picture of him at the Murphy Center. He came right out you know, and told me this. He shared this information that he really had a hard time when he got out of the Army. And that this dog, he has a, name, a, a kind of pit bull mix named Precious, has really uh, saved him. And he's, he's really struggling, uh, battling his, uh, some addiction issues and also this PTSD. Uh, and his dog is really keeping him going. This fellow with the, his collie Tommy, also from Fort Collins, Vietnam Navy vet. I actually saw him a couple of weeks ago. We take care of his dog. We saw him a couple of weeks ago on the street corner of Mountain and College uh, playing his harmonica and he had, he had Timmy down there with him. Homeless veteran from Denver. It's just you know, a little bit of show and tell just to give you some different stories, but obviously close to, really close to his dog. He, he loved taking his dog for a walk. His, his dog suddenly was lame on his back leg, couldn't go for walks anymore. And it turned out he had ruptured his uh, cranial cruciate ligament, the most common knee, knee injury in people, and also the most common hind limb injury in dogs. 
and we were able to get some funding for him to get it fixed and that required especially surgeon it wasn't a street clinic Veteran stand downs happen across the United States for homeless veterans, multi service events. They get clothes, sleeping bags, legal advice, haircuts. Uh, and, and now veterinary care is kind of new. So we were doing this down at, in Denver, in uh, North Denver, on a really cold day. They would not let pets inside. So you can see the people lined up outside, wait, you know, we figured, hey, if they can hang out outside, we can work outside. So some frozen fingers, but we were still able to um, get the work done. Here's some of those veterans uh, with, with their pets as shown. You can just kind of see how much they care. This one guy, wheelchair was actually supposed to be for him. He put his pet in it to be good care. Grab a little coffee here. I've got a University of Minnesota vet school mug. I was able to able to go up to Minneapolis where we're going to do some street clinics also and talk with the students there that have their own their own program where they go to a uh, their own building once a month and do free veterinary clinics for um, pets of the homeless in Minneapolis. So it's actually a vet school program. But we have a vet school program here in Fort Collins at the Murphy Center, which are typically um, you can see right here. This is someone named John Mark. And as someone named named Bones, and we we go there every Tuesday afternoon, not currently. And three, two or three students from senior vet students from CSU that are part of community practice rotation will join us, and uh, we let them actually take the lead in providing care to the pets that are there. And usually, see five, six, seven, seven pets every Tuesday afternoon just for a few hours. So it's a great uh, opportunity for the students. It actually is the only only program where where veterinary students are actually going to a homeless shelter to do this uh, what we call street outreach work. Kind of a sad story here. This dog Max. I'll show you more about him, but uh, he ran into a really tough tough situation, and uh, Max now has a new John Mark now has a new dog, which I'll show you a little bit later. Some of the things happening in cities. Uh, here's Eugene, Oregon, a really progressive city where they decided that you couldn't have a you couldn't have your pet downtown unless you actually lived there. So some of these uh, homeless folks were probably panhandling with their pets. That probably is more productive. And and to stop that, they put this prohibition on on, be, on having your pets uh, in this part of town unless you live there. Certainly, China is, is fairly uh, unfriendly toward living under bridges. Here's their solution. And this is a reason why um, you know, homeless shelters, most almost all homeless shelters don't allow pets because they're, they're so tight on space, they're unwilling to carve out separate space for the pets, and the pets obviously can't run around in a situa situation like this. This is a men's shelter. But even the shelter in Fort Collins, uh, the downtown shelter, um, after they serve up their meal, they unroll blue mats on the floor and, and everyone's sleeping side to side. So there's just no way that, that pets are going to stay there unless separate accommodations are made. This is actually a really good solution uh, for, for cities that have folks living outside. This is just um, find some unused park space and just create a free homeless campground with facilities. As you see here in Durango, trash. They have um, they have porta potties out of the picture. They have running water. You know, the picnic tables. People can get together. This looks similar to what's happening in Fort Collins right now at the Oslan Center, except it's um, a different situation because the tents have to be um, at least six foot apart, and there's not supposed to be any socialization between uh, people that are living in the tents. With other groups, they consider them households. But uh, if you go to Oslo Center, you'll see there, there is plenty of socialization happening. I think it's hard for, hard to ask people not to interact with, with other folks, especially say you're you're in a tent. You don't have you don't have social media. You don't have TV. You have any way of communicating. Talking about the affordability gap, I, I think that is self-explanatory meaning. The cost of, of veterinary care far exceeds people's ability to pay. And it doesn't really just apply to homeless folks. Uh, this fellow in the right has 
this cat um, who's passed out. He's in San Francisco on the Embarcadero. Uh, he's got a cat on a leash. He tries to make these, um, these reeds he weaves together and, and tries to sell, but here you can see his kitty. And his kitty is well taken care of. He's got food. Um, and I kind of took a closer look at the cat to make sure he seemed okay, and, and he did. Here's that affordability gap as we look at uh, the cost of veterinary services and continuing to increase much faster than U.S. median household income. So now we're talking about a bigger population, just low-income folks that just can't afford veterinary care. It's fantastic that we're able to do MRI and CT imaging and, and laparoscopy in pets, but it's becoming farther and farther out of the reach of most pet owners. There is a major effort to provide a, a program and call it, we're calling it Align Care, which is an access to care program. And it's kind of like Medicare uh, for pets. So you could call it maybe Pedicare. Uh, and they're trying to provide funding and qualifications for folks that they actually can go to existing veterinary clinics and, and get subsidized care very similar to a, a Medicare model. And it's a, big, it's a big project. It'll be interesting to see if it actually rolls out and gets functional. They're still, uh, they're, I think they're getting ready to implement some pilot projects in some smaller areas. You know, sadly, when uh, what happens in the middle of the night uh, is many of these pets do get euthanized and it, can, it could be a homeless person, it could also be just a low income person or a person that just can't afford $7,000 of surgery. And so oftentimes they'll come to say our emergency clinic and have that conversation and we end up having to put their pets down. They might have a treatable problem, but it's, it's economic euthanasia because the reason for euthanasia is a, a lack of funding, funds to pay for the procedure. Many of a low income uh, pet owners, uh, even some of us could qualify probably for that, have options. That, that can get us care, things like care credit, which is a you know, credit card you can use for pets. There's third party payment plans. Hospitals will sometimes set you up with payment plans. Pet insurance can be a really good thing for emergencies, but you know, it costs 50, 50 to $80 a month. So again, with this homeless population, that's not, those aren't options. So what they're really uh, narrowed down to is, you know, do they have any friends or relatives? Most of them don't. They're socially isolated. Their families have rejected them. Their friends are, if they have friends, they're on the street and they're in the same boat. Sometimes veterinarians will, will do work for free, and it's awesome they do, but there's really limits on how often they can do that or how much they can discount. And when folks have no money, it's not really a discount, it's doing it for free. This happens, it's, it's sad in some ways, but it will save the life of that pet is someone will give up their pet, uh, the veterinary clinic, someone there will adopt it. They can get it, fi they can afford to get it fixed, they can get a discount on getting it fixed, and um, the pet goes on to a new life, uh, and the, the owner's without their pet. But most frequently this then ends up, this is what happens, is this euthanasia. We don't do euthanasia at our street clinics, but we'll just, we'll actually pay for, have someone go to a, a nearby a 24 hour clinic to have that done and take care of the aftercare so they can even get the ashes back potentially. I showed you uh, a Max, Max dog with John Mark in front of the Murphy Center earlier. And I, this was uh, several years ago when uh, John Mark called me and, and told me that Max was training. This is an example of a really tough situation. It's a very, this is a, um, we clipped him in and done some anesthesia here because this was such a painful condition. This was at our emergency hospital after seeing him at the Murphy Center. Uh, we had some funding in place to cover this, but it's a really angry and flood inflamed perineum, uh, unable to do a you know, rectal exam. And it turns out he had a very rare condition called perineal hernia. Some of you that uh, are interested in veterinary medicine, and even those of you aren't, just to show you a really abnormal x-ray, these are the gas-filled intestines, and you can see that they're completely pinched off here. So they are complete intestinal blockage uh, of everything. And this is a uh, 
somewhere between bones and here in retro. So it looks like we got knocked off. All right, you're good. We we're talking about Max, uh, and I may have got been interrupted here, but I just showed you a very abnormal condition: bilateral perineal hernia. We we sent him to get it to get it fixed, and it worked out really well, even though it cost seven thousand dollars. And there's a long story behind that. Unfortunately, two years later, this condition recurred, and it was going to even be a tougher surgery the second time, so we did have to uh, euthanize Max, but he had gotten two additional great years out of it. And then uh, I wanted to show you what happened. Uh, John Mark, uh, two weeks later, ended up with this new dog that ended, pretty much ended up on his doorstep. He sent me this text message talking about uh, how he got the dog named Cowboy. And just to summarize it, so you don't have to necessarily read it, but he had a note on his front doorstep and a friend of his who was in a wheelchair had been in an explosion in Afghanistan and was paralyzed, uh, committed suicide, and left a note on, on his door and asked him if he could be a provider for Cowboy short term. And of course, Cowboy became his uh, long, is his long term dog. And here he is at the CSU Oval where I, I did some care. I sometimes use the CSU Oval as my office if I have to meet someone to do some work. Back to Las Vegas, uh, here's, here's that expression again, what am I supposed to do? We just have diagnosed this lady's a pit bull here with a parvovirus, so it's a pretty tough, tough disease, but uh, we were able to find a volunteer that was willing to take that, take that dog to the vet every day, a couple times a day for a week and, and got the dog through it. So, you know, thanks for, for the, Awesome volunteers. Many of the volunteers that can help with these don't have to necessarily be veterinary folks or, or necessarily trained, They'd just be willing to transport pets. Mentioned earlier really that most homeless shelters don't allow pets. And entry level housing also generally doesn't allow pets, or it's so expensive to get into entry level housing with a pet. Thousands of dollars just for the housing, first last month's rent, damage deposit, and usually a if they do allow a dog, it may only be a small dog. And if they do allow a small dog, it's gonna be additional money. Here's a um, homeless veteran from Denver uh, with this dog that we took care of. And briefly, here's a picture of, of a lady at the Murphy Center again. And her dog actually is, is a real service dog. She's, she's homeless, she lives with her daughter who also has a service dog. And they have a, a seizure a medical condition of a, without an underlying diagnosis as to what's the cause of the seizures. It's a genetic condition. So they both have their own seizure detection service dog. And uh, we, we've provided them with uh, service dog vests because they couldn't afford them. And, and both their dogs, because they're actually half French bulldog and half English bulldog, have lots of medical problems. I did want to mention, though, that there is, uh, as you all know, there's a lot of uh, service dog fraud out there where, where folks are misrepresenting emotional support animals as service dogs. And we could uh, get into emotional support animal versus service dog. It's been quite a bit of time talking about it, but I just wanted to mention that um, that is, is an issue. But the, the reason it's an issue among the homeless pet owners is they just want to ride on the bus. And if they, uh, many, most cities do not allow pets to ride on the bus unless they fit in a carrier. So they, they often will allow small dogs, but they don't allow uh, larger dogs unless they're a service, service dogs. I worked with a uh, CSU social worker named Fred Palmer, and we did a study of the 50 largest cities in the United States. Let's see if I've got it here. We looked at the public transportation uh, guidelines for the 50 largest cities in the United States that, that found that um, most, most cities, the high majority would allow dogs that were in a crate to go in the bus. The crate would have to fit on someone's lap or under their seat, so it couldn't be out in the aisle. So and they have to be able to carry it, obviously. So any dog larger than about 40 pounds isn't going to make it 
onto a bus. There are a few cities like Boston and Seattle that allow any dog on the bus or subway as long as they're leashed. Sometimes they don't allow them at rush hour. And then unfortunately there's 10 cities that only allow service dogs on the bus. And so these might be cities where uh, someone may, you know, if they want to rep misrepresent their dog as a service dog, it's, po it's possible they're going to do that so they can get on the bus and get somewhere. For example, take their dog to a street clinic or get access to care. People do get creative. Here's New York City where um, it's one of the uh, places where they have a liberal policy. Dogs just need to be in a some kind of bag or open container. And so as you can see these pit bulls being, being carried around. When I was in Detroit, I, we compared uh, how strict uh, Detroit is compared to Windsor, Canada, which is right across the, the bridge from Detroit. So Detroit is one of those strict cities that only allows service dogs. And Windsor, Canada, they do allow, they do allow dogs in there. They're kind of confused about, uh, they're asking for a letter from a physician or nurse. So that's emotional support animals. So basically they, they allow emotional support animals right across the bridge. Here in Moscow, the, here in Moscow, and in, in Moscow, dogs are allowed to ride the subway on their own. These are, they have more street dogs there, which are not owned pets, they just live in the community. And apparently in Moscow, it's told to me by a veterinary nurse from there, they know the subway stops and where they go and they actually ride the subway on their own and might get off at a certain stop at a certain time because there might be some leftover potatoes behind a certain restaurant. So that's what happens in Moscow. In Japan, uh, cats are a more common pet and, and often do ride the subways. And here's a picture of a, uh, miniature horse ride in the subway in Germany. In the US actually, the miniature horses are a, a type of service animal. And I think they run into problems when they try to bring them to grocery stores. And finally, Boston is very another pet friendly city. Uh, that, that bunny probably does need to be in a container on a leash, but it was out. This is kind of a havoc slide because this dog has been made into a therapy dog, or at least a companion dog, it's not necessarily a trained therapy dog, works in a homeless shelter. Excuse me, I think this is really a great idea and I wish, I uh, hope some of you would consider thinking about how we could do this here, say in Northern Colorado and some of the homeless shelters. Um, do we have pets that would um, do really well in this kind of environment, providing some comfort for, for these folks that don't have pets? And again, um, here's some issues that you know we've attacked, and we are trying to put some address local transportation. We have a, a new protocol that would allow pets to ride on public transportation as long as they are wearing a cage muzzle, which is uh, not a restricted muzzle. Muzzle just doesn't allow them to bark or to bite. Uh, they can still drink water, and they'd also be vet checked. They'd have a green tag on that muzzle that says, you know, we call it ticket to ride. So working on things like that, you know, we'd love to get more therapy dogs slash companion dogs in the, in the homeless shelters. We'd like to find ways to make homeless shelters pet friendly. I'm going to show you some here shortly. We're going to talk about move into some other issues. And the first one is co-sheltering, which is where uh, where shelters allow people and pets. And we're gonna talk about different kinds of shelters. So Noah's Animal House is a pilot project. It's gotten a lot of attention. It is in North Las Vegas. I've been there. I took these pictures. And uh, the women that go there is a domestic uh, violence shelter called Shade Tree right next door. So it's a domestic violence shelter for women. They keep their pets next door, uh, separately housed um, with a veterinary technician oversight, but they have uh, cover rooms where they can spend as much time as they want, as you see here on the right with their pets. And now here's some information about domestic violence shelters. I think this is really a place for, for many of you where you can really do some good work in converting domestic violence shelters into pet friendly um, shelters. So many women won't go into domestic violence shelters. Some of you probably know about half of them won't. Um, 
because they know their pets could be victimized by their partner. And they don't want to be without their cats. So they're saying, I'm just not going in without my cats or my dog. Here's some more pictures of the, of the cuddle room. And I think the, the owner's right outside, but the dog and cat are hanging out. Here's some of their cat housing. It turned out they actually had an upper respiratory outbreak and I, I had to serve as a consultant from a distance on that. They didn't make these um, cat houses big enough. They, there's a new study that shows they need to have eight square foot of floor space to really affect con, spread of con, infectious disease. You know, and that's a big deal now. As you know, so now a lot of us know about um, how things like upper respiratory viruses do get transmitted because this is what's happening in these cats. They're just too close together. So they don't have the social separation required. So instead of eight square feet, they only have four square feet. So they had an upper respiratory outbreak, which would have been disastrous if any of the cats had died. And luckily none of them did, even though they were pretty sick and on IV fluids. Here's another pet friendly shelter in Arizona. I just kind of did some research. And here's uh, the first pet friendly shelter for domestic violence shelters where the pets actually can live with the women because they all have separate uh, separate rooms. So instead of bunk bed model, they have separate rooms. This is in New York City and it was, this is actually uh, not the schematic drawings, but this is now open and it was very well funded by um, a Mars pet care that owns Purina. Here's, here is a picture of that shelter. They have 30 apartments and they can keep the pets in the apartment in their apartments with them and they also have can keep their kids in there. Over in, in Honolulu they have a, a pet friendly shelter. It's it's a homeless shelter, it's not a domestic violence shelter. They've used a, a cut up uh, shipping containers to make little houses. We've seen that here in Fort Collins with some uh, business applications. Here's kind of what it looks like. You can see it would be with that climate, etc. it'd be very friendly for pets. These are, and here's, here's George again, the homeless veteran whose dog needed a knee surgery. These are some of the other shelters uh, that need to be, could be pet friendly and, and, and making them pet friendly could go a long way toward uh, promoting, I think, the healing of folks that are there. Uh, you know, these are certainly radical ideas to have a pet shelter at county jails, but if someone does go into jail, Who's going to take care of their pet if they're living on the street? Hopefully, they you know they can find one of their buddies too. But oftentimes, it's really problematic. Same same when they go to the hospital, um, and that's coming up right now for a lot of people are, that are being hospitalized that, that may not have anyone to take care of their pet. They live alone, so they're having to try to find foster care. So it wouldn't be that big of a reach for um, for these facilities to have a separate um, supervised uh, little pet shelter. So people could bring their pets and have an opportunity to visit with them. California is probably the most pet friendly in regards to providing pet friendly shelters. They, they just uh, provide $5 million for that very reason. You can see this was uh, July of last year, not that long ago. And now we're seeing these regional pet shelters. Kind of wrapping things up now. And I know I've gone through the slides quickly, but I, but I wanted you to just be exposed to some of these ideas. We've still got one concept to talk about, which is uh, One Health. Here's a project we're working on right now at CSU. If any of you are interested, we have a uh, third year veterinary student who just got a grant from PetSmart Charities to set up a homeless pet owner hotline. And, and our, our vision here is to make this a national hotline where someone actually answers the phone and that someone's probably gonna be a veterinary student who's gonna have access to all the resources that a person calling in might need for their pet. Where can they, where can they get, is there a pet friendly shelter? Where is it, where could they get veterinary care? Where could they get pet food? Where could they get pet supplies if they need it? And uh, they, we might, right now, a telemedicine uh, is being allowed for the first time in states like Colorado, where it really previously was very, very limited and so if that model stays in place, we could actually do some telemedicine as part of this hotline. So it's, it, we're just uh, starting that project. I'm talking more about street medicine specifically. Uh, street medicine, if, for those of you interested in, in medicine, either human or 
veterinary uh, street medicine is kind of an unofficial subspecialty where you're you are doing work out on the street away from a medical clinic or veterinary clinic and you're having to really go back to basics using physical examination and history as some of your main diagnostics and i was able to go to this uh, symposium last fall in pittsburgh i was the only veterinarian there but lots of lots of medical doctors here's here's what it looks like out on the street um, this is an area of, of pennsylvania but most of the medical schools have uh, street medicine teams and so we're trying to kind of follow along that with uh, veterinary schools and create street medicine teams too matter of fact here's our philadelphia street medicine team and the picture doesn't look that that different we're uh, in a park and we're checking out people's pets, but we're not checking out the people necessarily. So I think you can probably predict that One Health, of which we're going to get to in a minute, is going to be having veterinary students and medical students and veterinary uh, personnel and MDs and physicians assistants all at the same time, same place, providing care in the street setting. setting. It makes, makes all the sense in the world. Here's a Chicago street medicine team, uh, UIC is University of Illinois, Chicago. And we actually have a street team in Chicago that works along, is doing some One Health stuff also. And here you see the, um, some of the folks in Chicago that they're caring for, you know, they got pets, so they may care for these folks and the folks say, well, my pet's sick, or, and what about zoonotic disease? I already showed you that someone that lived in their van where we had things going back and forth. That can happen, and, and most human docs don't really know about zoonotic disease. That they don't, they don't necessarily know what's what can be transmitted. Can parvovirus be transmitted? What about leptospirosis? How do they how do they deal with that? Especially the ectoparasites, heartworm disease. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Here's a, again more info about the Chicago team. But we've been we've been trying to team up with them, and then we finally actually went to when we went to Detroit. We hooked up with some medical students from Wayne State University and did a street clinic uh, at a homeless shelter there. So now we're, we are doing this, uh, what we're calling One Health. We'll get into that in a second. You know, here's those uh, chihuahuas again, but sometimes street medicine means going right into the encampments, not necessarily having folks come to you, but, but we're going right to where the folks live. And we might be using a bicycle, we might be just be using a backpack and just going, uh, tent to tent, shack to shack. On the right is Indianapolis. The Spendus Family Clinic is not a veterinary clinic, but they do use all volunteer physicians, uh, over 300 of them to provide free veterinary care uh, for those in the Venice, California area along the boardwalk. They do outreach, they, they bring people in. Here's our veterinary team uh, working with a, veter a medical team from U University of Southern California Medical School out in Bakersfield in an abandoned warehouse. You can see our, our veterinarian right back here uh, taking care of uh, this person's pet. And really kind of finally summarize what One Health is. This picture probably sums it up. We're doing veterinary medicine and, and human medicine and other services, maybe could include dentistry. Uh, we could be are doing mental health, it could be addic doing addiction counseling, counseling, we could do social work all at the same time, same place. It makes sense. And so our idea that uh, another idea we're working on, sorry, part of this blocked off is create this van uh, in Eastern Slope of Colorado. It's going to go out on weekends. It's going to be totally staffed by volunteers that are going to rotate. So we're not going to be asking very much of anyone's time, including uh, Obviously, veterinary uh, students, veterinary supervisors, medical students with their supervisors. Now that there's a medical school being housed at CSU, we can uh, definitely use uh, Fort Collins as their home base for this. Social workers, uh, addiction specialists, possibly human dentists, possibly veterinary dentists, um, going out on weekends, hitting, hitting some of the smaller towns uh, also that maybe don't have act good access to care also hitting homeless encampments still trying to figure it all out we need, we need a lot of money for that so applying for some grants here's some of the stuff that um, happened in csu is doing all this work is really fun you, again you don't have to be going from a veterinary point of view i know um, 
I'm very familiar with Havoc and from a social work and public health point of view, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved, especially in creating this One Health Street Outreach. So I'm gonna be accessible to answer any questions. Um, if any of you are interested in doing anything, I can kind of help you steer you in the right direction. You wanna get involved in any projects. We'll have an opportunity for follow-up after, uh, after this class. So thanks for the opportunity to speak to you, even remotely. Sorry, don't getting, not can meet you in person, but hopefully at some time and some place, that could still happen. Again, thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Geller. Um, so I just, I had a couple of questions. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, sure. I mean, I kind of was jotting down questions as we went and then, and then three slides later, you would answer them. So, <laughs> um, so it was a great presentation. Um, but I was really curious about, um, you know, you've sort of talked about some of these co-treatment models. Um, mm -hmm. And is there, is there any evidence um, that people, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, people, homeless people, do they access medical care more frequently because, or, you know, support services, um, more frequently because of the animal component? Um, that is great, a great comment and question because we actually believe that the One Health model, part of the reason that it's, it's such a good model is that they will, uh, where, where folks would maybe be averse to medical care, I mean, who, who really wants to go to a doctor, right? They will seek out care for their pets and, and if they happen to bring their pets to a street clinic and there's some a medical students there or a nurse practitioner says hey can i just check you out take the blood pressure check the blood glucose or whatever and they say yeah i'm here might as well do it uh, that's a model that's i've been used up at, at uc davis at a, a place run by vet students um, and it works really well so you're abs absolutely right this increases access to medical care uh, because uh, folks that typically uh, again avoid it or wouldn't have access to it now have it through uh, getting care for their pet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And, and are there um, counseling services that happen through some of that, um, that the treatment models? Mm -hmm. Yes, we use. Uh, I, I mentioned Fred Palmer because he's a local guy. Uh, he's working at the Osmond Center right now. He's a social worker and uh, he's he's a uh, graduate student in social work at CSU. Mm -hmm. And he's he's at all our street clinics, and he will take. We've had folks say, you know, I had a lady say, um. I might go out on the railroad tracks this afternoon. And I kind of kind of went over my head until I realized what she was talking about. And so I we kind of referred her to Fred right at the time and he interviewed her and you know kind of I really believe he talked her through it. So so having that social work team there is a really important part. That would to me that would be the second piece. Veterinarians first, caseworkers second, a medical personnel third, and then you know going going even beyond that maybe dentistry um, addiction counseling etc mental mental health of course specifically right right and then um just kind of finally i was thinking about um how is there a role for pets in terms of helping people transition from being homeless to living um, you know, a, a, I don't know what the correct term is, a home to life, um, you know, moving into an apartment. And I'm wondering if, you know, I think, you know, so often, uh, of course, you know, people uh, take care of their pets before they take care of themselves, right? You know, and you see that with the homeless population, you know, they'll, they'll feed their pet before they feed themselves, or they'll access care for their pet before. And I'm wondering if there's, um, there's a role for uh, you know, almost to almost to leverage the fact that they have a pet to help with that transition um, into a home life. Does that make sense? I don't know if that. Well, it does make sense, and uh, I can even give you a local example. But many, some of these cities have a great uh, housing programs where it's kind of transitional or sometimes even permanent supportive housing, where they they will move into this housing, and uh, the, the movement right now is to make sure that that housing is pet friendly. And we've been told that uh, many folks that have been homeless that do move into this transitional or permanent supportive housing, if they don't have a pet, they get one very soon because now they're allowed to have one. And it was too tough for them living on the street. Mm -hmm. If you think about having a pet, I mean, I didn't go into it, but 
you know, you can't walk in really through any doors. You can't even walk into a medical clinic. So how do you, how do you get medical care? So now they're allowed to have pets and we're uh, figuring out ways to provide a uh, better aid care at this, these housing uh, developments. And the one I was uh, thinking of here in Fort Collins called Red Tail Ponds, which are uh, is limited to folks that have previously been homeless. And we go there a couple of times a year and do clinics. And I believe their pets do provide uh, an opportunity, especially if, we're, if we bring some medical folks or social work folks with us to get that additional care where, again, uh, there may not be, be much inertia to go out and, and, and get the medical care if it, if it doesn't come to them. Yeah. Great. Well, like I said, you answered all my other questions. So, um, so thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, you're welcome. I, I'm sorry I didn't get to do it in person, but um, hopefully next year. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop recording right now.